All right, brilliant. Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails Common Ground. I'm Alva Kajali, Special Projects Associate here at The Rail, and today I have the pleasure of welcoming founding producer and director of the Artist Profile Archive, Sophie Chahinian, alongside participating artists Alice Aycock, John Kessler, Robert Longo, and Ark Manero Niles, in conversation with the fabulous Anne C. Collins. We're also so, so lucky to have the poet Angela Narciso Torres here with us today, who's tuning in from the West Coast and who will read to close today's program. A few quick notes before we get started. First, we started all of our events here with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we're on Lenapahoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. Part and parcel of this acknowledgement is the continued recognition that Black lives matter. Secondly, here at The Rail, we're celebrating our 21st anniversary. It's a very special year for us. And we're celebrating by working on our first ever endowment campaign, which will ensure the continuity of the print edition of The Rail, our public programming, and other forays into the arts, humanities, and sciences for generations to come. In that spirit, uh, I'll drop, I encourage you to check in the chat for more resources, links, and information that I'll drop in just a moment. But now it's my honor to welcome our wonderful panel of guests. Founding producer and director of the Artist Profile Archive, Sophie Chahinian is a Los Angeles native. She became involved with independent film production early on as a producer and actor before working for light and space artist Eric Orr in the late 90s. She holds an MA in Contemporary Art from the University of Manchester through Sotheby's and a BA in Philosophy from Occidental. She started the Artist Prof Profile Archive as a platform for primary information allowing artists the opportunity to speak about their own work in their own words. And she's joined by one of her artists, Alice Aycock, who's known for installation, land art, and sculpture. In 2014, seven of her large scale works were installed on Park Ave, just nearby in Midtown Manhattan. Her retrospective, Some Stories Are Worth Repeating, a worthy axiom, uh, was first shown at the Parish Art Museum and then traveled in two parts <laughs> to the Art Design and Architecture Museum at UC Santa Barbara and the Santa Barbara Museum of Art in 2014. She's been based in New York City since 1968. She's joined by a number of artists. First up, uh, known for his kinetic sculptures and multimedia installations, artist John Kessler's work critiques the current obsession with images and surveillance and explores themes of anxiety and climate crises via a combination of found object and motorized machines. He's currently a professor at the School of the Arts at Columbia University, and his work is included in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney, the Walker Art Center, and LACMA. Uh, next up, we have artist Robert Longo, whose work is represented as well in the MoMA, the Broad, and the Centre Georges Pompidou. For the past 40 years, he's been represented by Metro Pictures New York, and his debut solo exhibition, I Do Fly After Summer Merrily, at his new representation pace gallery just closed a few weeks ago. We were lucky enough to have Robert on our program for a conversation on the exhibition, which you can check out. I'll drop a link in the chat in a minute. Last but not least, artist Ark Minoro Niles makes vivid, brightly hued paintings that radically expand our understanding of the tradition of genre painting and portraiture. Though intensely personal and autobiographical, his work engages in universal subjects of the domestic and family life while also referencing a rich tapestry of historical predecessors, including Italian and Dutch Baroque, history painting, color-filled painting, and much more. Originally from Washington, DC, he currently lives and works in Brooklyn, where he shows with Rachel Uffner Gallery on the Lower East Side. And finally, keeping them in conversation and in questions, we have regular contributor and friend, Anne C. Collins. She holds a BFA in film and television from NYU and an MFA in art criticism and writing from the School of Visual Arts. Her work has appeared in Degree Critical and Variables West, and her film editing projects include Joan Didion, The Center Will Not Hold, Can You Bring It, Bill T. Jones, and D-Man in the Waters, alongside the Netflix series, The Pharmacist. Her work has screened at Sundance, Berlin, and New York film festivals all around. She lives in Brooklyn from where she joins us today. Anne, take it away. Thanks, Malika. Such a nice group to have a chat with. Um, I wanted to start by talking to Sophie, and Sophie, I wanted to ask you, you, um, we heard a little bit about your background, but um, can you describe the artist profile archive, what it is and how it works, just to give us all a little background on that? I think you are muted. Yes, so I'm no longer mute. Um, uh, thanks, Anne. Thanks for, for moderating this. And I'm Sophie Shahinian. 
And the Artist Profile Archive is an online collection of short documentary films on contemporary artists talking about their own work in their own words. And um, it really came from um, a combination of my having experience working for an, art, an artist, Eric Orr, and knowing how he spoke about his work, and thereafter going to graduate school and studying contemporary art, there's a vast difference in the type of language that's used to speak about art in the academic world versus the real art world, or at least that's what I found. And I thought in, it's great to, to you know, be involved in academia and to read critical essays and what have you and theory and all this kind of thing. But at the end of the day, my favorite thing was just listening to artists talk about their own work. And I thought that's a much more accessible way for people to be able to learn about art because I think contemporary art has a little bit of a, uh, an elitist kind of stigma attached to it for some groups of people. And I think that comes from their not being able to understand what it's about in part due to the fact that the language is somewhat esoteric. And, and so, you know, we invite artists to talk about their work in, in the way that they normally speak about it, which ends up being very accessible and it ends up being a great way to, to learn about art, you know? So that, that's, that was, that's the background. Great. And so in terms of um, the artist profile archive, there are uh, images, there is text, there are these short documentaries. What about short form documentary appealed to you uh, in terms of creating this? Why an online website with short form documentaries? Is there anything about that particular medium that you thought uh, would be most beneficial? Well, short form documentaries um, are a lot less expensive than long format documentaries. <laughs> That's just part of it. But no, I, I actually really love the Art 21 series. And, and I know that has expanded since then to include shorter format films. But I feel like you go to Art 21 when you already know that you love an artist and you want to see them, uh, you know, over an hour and a half period of time. The, the real purpose of, of our platform, and it is a multimedia platform, it's been expanded to become multimedia recently, is to provide an introduction. And then from there, people can, can expand their own interests and research and do whatever they like to do, but they get a succinct amount of information and it doesn't take very long to, to you know, digest it. It's, they're usually between 10 and 15 minutes, some, some of them are even shorter, eight, let's say eight to 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just kind of a digestible amount. Or it, it used to be a digestible amount when I started. Now I think people think that, you know, 45 seconds is the right amount of time. But, but anyway, that, that's, we thought short is 15 minutes back then. Right, right, that attention span keeps shrinking. Um, can you yeah. talk a little bit about your process and just walk us through sort of contacting artists, what happens when you go into their studios or when you're filming them, how you're forming narratives, anything um, about what you're looking for or how you're shaping things? Well, um, I, I like to leave things somewhat open-ended so that it does feel more like a conversation. It, it, it is a conversation in a sense, but the, the, the person who, in, you know, in this case, me, the interviewer is not present in, in the film, but just asking, asking questions. And, and um, it's apparent that the artist is speaking to somebody, we just don't know who. Um, but my, my process is just one of, <clears throat> I'm a student of art myself and I'm there to learn and I'm hoping that, that whatever I learn gets passed on to, to the video version so that other people can learn too. And a lot of times I do have to ask some silly or very basic questions only to invite the artist to speak about things that are, that are a little more basic so that we have some some uh, background information and, and, and what have you and kind of get that out of the way and move on to other things. Right, so that curiosity is sort of leading you. You're in this privileged position of entering with a camera and I know you have a collaborator that you work with and as your curiosity kind of guides you through the process, that's sort of what you're 
then crafting and shaping to put onto each artist's page and onto your site, right? So you're our eyes and ears into this wonderful rabbit hole. We all wish we could fall down with you, right? Right. So yeah, the the um, the site itself did feel a lot like a rabbit hole to me because there were all these wonderful thumbnails and uh, you know you can click on it and go in, you could deep dive and spend some time. You know, not an hour and a half, which is often you know, better. Um, you can spend some time with an artist and go back and revisit and, you know, scroll through quotes and videos and um, images. Uh, so it is this really nice way of connecting with someone immediately. There's a real immediacy to it that I much appreciated. Um, speaking to our collection of artists who have collaborated with Sophie, what um, appealed to you? Uh, how did you first hear about this? Did Sophie reach out to you? And what was the appeal about participating in building this archive? I don't know if I should go first, but I will. Um, so I think Sophie reached out to me, as I recall, Sophie, you may, and it was at a particularly optimal time because I had something going on at the parish, a mini retrospective of drawings, and then we were doing Park Ave. And it just, it, you know, it was really good because we captured a, you know, a time in which we could deal with much older work in the form of drawing and photo photographs and also the Park Avenue installation. And I guess when I skimmed through it again, um, what I thought was two things. One, I once read a book where uh, some was talking about identity and the, the, the man said, or whatever author said, if you were to meet your five-year-old self, you would know that person, that you know who you are because you see yourself in the mirror every day, every week or whatever. And it's really interesting to see myself talk from five or six or whatever years ago and to see, oh, that's who she was. And, so, and you really kind of separate and you go, did I mean that? You know, I meant it then, do I still, who am I, so to speak? And it's a good way of, for as an artist, re, re meeting yourself again and saying, yeah, you're still saying the same thing, so you must have met it. And then the other thing I would add is that for someone like me who makes these big things, and you know, a lot of times I'm rendering in a computer and it goes off and it's just a photograph and it's built, for Sophie to have captured the drama of what it takes to put something like, to have closed Park Avenue, two lanes on, and all the cranes, and I think we had six different whatever operating instead of, oh, here it is as a photo. Um, for me, it was great because most people don't see that. And, and I tend to forget it. And so I thought it was particularly, uh, instruct it, it, you know, it really added something that all the photographs on the internet after something's built don't convey. And, um, and, you know, it is dramatic and it is a little exciting and it is, you know, it's nuts and bolts. It's not just arty farty. It's, you know, that thing can't, you know, fall down in the middle of the night on somebody or whatever. So, and I like that it's not arty farty. And I like that Sophie said, let's hear what artists have to say instead of just the lingo of whatever, even though we often are arty farty, but okay. So I said my thing, all right. Well, I just wanted to add to that, that Alice, you're absolutely right. That was a particularly optimum moment because we actually, I had seen the Paris uh, the Parish Art Museum show, but then it moved to Santa Barbara and you were doing a talk there that we got to follow you around and, and see you standing in front of the, the work and talking about it. And then we got to do the interview in, in the studio and film that Park Avenue. That was amazing. I remember that Matt and I went there in the middle of the night yeah. and we were just, you know, so it, it was just so exciting. And as you said, I mean, you know, we don't realize when we see your your work that that there there was a lot that went into getting it there. You know, and all seeing all the cranes and the trucks and the lights. I mean, it was really really exciting, and I, I really am glad that we were able to to capture that. Well, you didn't get me hiding in the car, terrified. <laughs> well, I'm glad about that because I was definitely you know going oh shit. 
<laughs> so and it was cold but yeah, anyway. it was freezing yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay so anyway yeah but it is exciting I think Alice especially in terms of the fact that you are doing this large-scale installation work it reminded me of the Maisel's films about the Christos when you know they did the gates or umbrellas um how incredible to see the process the artist's process of all of the steps that go into something whether it's a small scale work or a large scale, you know, installation piece like this. And I thought, Sophie, that that was a wonderful kind of um, lineage and tradition you were drawing from that, that uh, crossroads, uh, the crossroads of documentary filmmaking and fine art making. Um, and that wonderful kind of, um, you know, documentation of thinking and of process in addition to um, sort of a more maybe two-dimensional documentation of a finished piece, you know, that we were sort of seeing everything that would, that went into that, um, you know, in a very intimate and um, exciting and also very fresh kind of way. Um, how about the other artists uh, who are with us? Um, anybody else have a similar experience or a different experience? John Kessler. Oh, mine, was, mine was quite different. It was, it was very intimate. It was in my studio. Um, so Sophie uh, contacted me, and we um, and we uh, agreed to meet at the studio. And I was I was just embarking on a new series of pieces which no one had seen, and um, and you know it was as as all as everyone knows you know when you when you're on a new series, you're, it's kind of private, and and you you feel like you need to protect them. <clears throat> And there is something that when I look at what we did now, I've moved way beyond it. And yet it's a testament and an, like a, a moment in time that seems very important in terms of the seeds of what came like years later. Um, but there was something about the, the exchange that, you know, I, I felt good about it after, after it was filmed and Sophie's questions were really probing and wonderful, but it was really in the editing that, the the piece came together and um you know and i think that's the power of of this little profile is how it succinct it is in terms of its intention and and you know its possibilities and showcasing the work and showcasing my history and but it's very intimate it's really in the studio it's not on park avenue with cranes um <laughs> and the the joke that just recently happened was my mom is in a retirement community out in California and she um, and I went out to visit her and she wanted me to lecture to her friends which were you know 50 odd people in the synagogue you know six feet apart you know COVID conditions and whatever and I said mom what like she said you're going to lecture about your work and I said yes I am and she said uh, here's what I want you to do I want you to show the artist profile um, uh, video and then answer some questions. And I said, mom, you know, I'm going out there, I'm flying out there and I'm in front of your friends and you want me to just show a video of, of me talking instead of talking? And she goes, yeah, I love it that much. And I was like, okay, mom, whatever, whatever you want, I'll do. And so, so it was adorable. I, you know, showed the video and then there were lots of questions about that. Um, so I don't, I never told Sophie, that that's Thank that you happened. For telling me, John, that's really yeah. wonderful. <laughs> it's so cute. From She's really mom. a fan. <clears throat> She's a big fan. <laughs> it is really nice to have something that is then a springboard for future conversations and future discussion. You know, um, and I, I love hearing about. Uh, you know, we think of the studio as such an intimate space, and and you're mentioning how when you're first developing something, you don't want people to come in. But Sophie and Matt came in nevertheless. And, um, you know, it's nice to hear about how, um, you know, watching the pieces, I get a sense of how tenderly they're shaped and crafted and, you know, how, how much um, love goes into uh, creating those stories and, and culling through that footage and shaping it. Um, you know, it, it does kind of provide this wonderful, um, you know, literally a document of what's going on. Um, but it, and, and it is a bit of a time capsule, you know, so to go yeah. back and have that to visit is really interesting. Um, I'm wondering about Robert Longo or Ark Nora Niles, what you're feeling about uh, your experience with Sophie coming into your studio. Either of you. Um, hi, I, um, we did it at the, the gallery. And so when Sophie reached out, 
it was kind of my, it was like my first show, I think. And so um, when she reached out, I went to the website and I saw the list of artists that have done it and the list of artists that were going to do it. And I just thought, why is she asking me? And so I was just really excited. I was really, it was really nice of her to include me. But um, it also really made me think about when I was an undergrad, I had like this um, playlist on YouTube of all these different like artist talks I would listen to. And so just to be a part of that, you know, was really amazing. But then also, I never really thought about it before when I was watching all these talks and like, or like tours of uh, shows about the people who took the time to make it and like all the work that sort of like went into that to um, share the artist's voice. That actually, like what Sophie was talking about, to give you like a little intro to like one thing where you can kind of go off and find longer videos or dive deeper if you wanted to. And so, it was a really interesting um, experience for me. And especially I feel with your work, which is so personal and autobiographical, um, you know, the references to, um, you know, art history might be found, uh, you know, in a hundred years, but to have your personal uh, uh, voice describing it, I thought was so essential uh, that it was just giving so much more um, you know, so much more for a viewer to think about when looking at your work. Uh, you know, it was nice to have the, you know, it's, it's so wonderful to have your voice included in um, what's available to a viewer who wants to dig in, you know. Yeah, and I really enjoyed talking with them because things I didn't even sort of think about kind of will pop up, you know. And so I think that sort of just kind of goes towards like her just kind of following the conversation and you know, picking up on little things every now and then. Yeah. Right. And, and Ark, you know, you're right. That was your first show. And yeah. <laughs> it's so amazing when I think about all your other shows I've been to since then. It's, I, 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 I hope that, it, you know, it'll be like a memento for you from your first show. And, and now, and are you at Lehman Maupin now? Is, is yeah. the gallery now? Yeah. yeah. Congratulations on that. It's just Thank so, you. you know, when I saw your show in LA at, at the UTA space, and then at Lehman Maupin, I mean, it's just so exciting that that you have become so busy and and you know have so many shows going on. So, thank and you. To have, I have, to have captured that moment, Sophie, is so exciting too. You know, to have, as you said, I, you know, it, it's just this moment, and then to sort of see, you know, um, careers unfolding or continue, you know, and continuing and bodies of work growing. Um, it's really wonderful to have someone speaking in a particular moment as opposed to much later looking back because things get forgotten, you know, or other conversations kind of take you away from the, you know, moment of, of uh, creating a work or, or thinking about a work. So it is, it's so lovely to have these um, small documentaries that, you know, grow over time, you know, and, and build meaning. Um, Robert Longo, what was it like for you to uh, have Sophie come and collaborate with you on these pieces? And what's it like for you when you look at your um, profile? How are you feeling about your participation in this project? Oh, he's on mute. Oh, you are on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. So Sophie, Sophie approached me about this, I think in 2014, very, very serious. She came to one of my openings and I was totally out of it. I said, yeah, 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 whatever. Contact the studio. And in my studio, Alex, who you saw briefly is kind of my firewall. So it's like, I, I don't like doing interviews in the studio. I don't like people coming to the studio in general. It's, it's, my, it's my space, it's, uh, I don't like it in general. And anyway, Sylvia was quite persistent. She came to another, like two years later, she came to another show, very, very, again, very, very serious. And I said, okay, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. I said, I'll tell Alex, I'll do it. And then I looked at some of the videos online and I was quite fascinated by how I didn't see her in the videos. I mean, I, that, 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 that blew me away. I felt like, you know, the artists were actually talking to me and I thought that was really important. And that intimacy was really great. And she made some artists that I know personally, 
seem even more interesting than I thought they were, which I thought was really great. There was a kind of level of intimacy that was really great. Also the way that she throws in this little bit of the, about their past where they, she wanted photographs of me from high school or things like that. And I thought that was really cool about seeing pictures of Joel Shapiro when he was really young or Ed Moses or things like that. I thought that was really kind of a wonderful aspect of it. The other aspect of it all, all is that it was, I was very, very comfortable and, and subsequently watching the video, I realized, I say, and I think we all have this maybe a sim similar situation that we tend to say a lot of the same shit over and over again. <laughs> but you know, that's because we don't have opinions, we have convictions and that, and I think ultimately the interview, when I watched that interview that I did with her, it's one of the best I've ever did. I'm very calm. Um, you know, I'm very, she made me feel very calm about stuff. And the thing was, is that, you know, I'm very proud of it. That's the other aspect. I'm very proud of that video. I, I refer to it, say, check that out, look at it. You know, it had, in that sense, I think it was really important. And, but her persistence of getting the video was the fact that she personally goes to artists and try to seek them out, you know, and introduces herself and says she wants to do this. It was very funny because I, I, I was so impressed how serious she, she was about it. And again, the fact that she's not in any videos, I think is really great. It, that, that level of being able to have this kind of, kind of like, as if the viewer is just sitting, sitting with the artist and talking to the artist, I thought it was really great. And Matt, who she works with is quite amazing. And he's, he's, he's completely invisible. He's the most pleasant person to be around as well. She has a great team around her. So Matt and Nick, these two guys work, that work with her, I think are really great. So they're, and she does a really great job. She's really incredibly serious about it. And yeah, I mean, I, I can go on and on, but anyway, I think they're really important and I think that, that she should do more of them and longer versions as well. Anyway. But well, Robert, my... Robert, I don't know if it was made clear that after you initially, after I initially invited you and you said that you would do it, that I was stonewalled by your studio <laughs> for, for so long that I had to show up to your next opening two years later to say, excuse me, but do you, did you forget? Like you told me that you would participate in this. I haven't been able to get anywhere with your studio. And that's, uh, you know, that, that was why that took so long. By the time I made the first contact to the time that we did, that was, it was three years by the time we did it. But, but then it actually turned out to be- It was a, it was a test, it was a test. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, and you know what? Sometimes when artists agree to participate initially, the first thing that I want to do is go and, and shoot an exhibit because it is often timed. You know, the invitations are often timed to to an exhibit going on, and so the first thing we want to do is make sure that we get the exhibit, even if the interview is going to come later. But then sometimes, and and so I'll just keep shooting exhibits until we get the interview. But sometimes I just keep shooting exhibits, and the interview doesn't come. So might have to start another section in, in the archive for exhibition footage mm -hmm. only. Right, right. Can you talk about that a little, Sophie, the idea of as a documentary filmmaker, you're not going in with a script, you're going in with a camera and an idea, you know, in a sense of the subject that you're, you know, the person that you're encountering, but uh, what kinds of surprises come up, you know, and, and how much of a shape or an idea about what the finished piece will be do you have? It sounds like, um, you know, in the case of Robert, you were kind of just shooting whatever you could, waiting for the guard dogs to, you know, part. <laughs> uh, okay, 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 okay. No, excellent job. I'm, I'm oh. sure. I'm sure we all are, are protective of our, our studio one way or the other. Very much so. Very much so. Uh, but how much of it is a surprise to you, Sophie? And how you know how much of this? Um, conversation that takes place in an interview or um, you know decisions about what you're going to shoot and when is it a collaboration with you and the artist how does it work um, well first of all I, I want to make that even though the the videos themselves are short the interviews are are kind of long I mean it takes at least an hour or an hour and a half of of interview to whittle it down to 10 interesting minutes so that that is one thing that we have to do that we have to put in a bit of time in the interview process so that we make sure that we get everything that we need but you know i do do a lot of research and i do you know as 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 alice and and robert said that you know 
things do get repeated, especially when an artist has a long career. And some of those things I think are really important to have in, in their profile. But sometimes I'm trying to, you know, ask questions that are uh, for subjects that are off the beaten path of things that, that they haven't talked about, you know, because I, I always like there to be just something different, you know, something maybe a little emotional or, or something that was not previously known. It's not that easy to get and I'm not always successful, but at least I have to try. So um, I do have I do have questions that I ask and and um, yeah, and I do, you know, I do see what else is out there as, as far as other videos or interviews that they've done too. Right. Yeah, I, I would add that uh, I remember um, you being very persistent and in a good way, and, but you know that there is this this funny kind of schizophrenia that we all have. Like we want to be known, we want everybody to be thinking about our work and out there. At the same time, we no, no, don't don't invade our privacy or our secret stash or whatever. You know, and it's that back and forth both in the studio and in general. What if we what if we give a secret away that we need? Or, you know, and I, you know, it's approach withdrawal all the time. And you were very persistent. And, and I, you know, I think that was great because sometimes I think we all put up little barriers there for one reason or another. Again, that kind of, we protect ourselves, and then we're, then we want everyone to know everything, you know, it's that back and forth. So, uh, but I think you did in your persistence. I, you know, I just admire you for that that you didn't let it get uh, underneath your skin. You just kept like the heat seeking missile going for what you needed to get. And it, uh, from my point of view, it was, it had a great result. So thank you. Thank, thank you for you. not, for putting up with our, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the temperament, well, the artistic temperament. <laughs> or just general heart, playing hard to get. It's not yeah. playing. <laughs> hard to get until all of a sudden no where are you where are you but at any rate you know so i think i think artists speaking about their work is a on one hand is secondary because the the voice that we choose to speak with is is our work and that's right. sense, so in that sense it's like i think you know the older you get the more secure you are that's why i think it was really interesting about arc that i saw his interview i thought it was incredibly sweet and and seeing the difference how you speak now is also even different. You're more even more secure. At, but the, at these kind of documents of, of one's career is kind of interesting. I mean, I, I realized when I did my video, I was very, very secure about what I was doing. I was very, very clear about what I was talking about. And I, I remember when I was younger, I was just brash and would just say whatever was on my mind. Uh, but yeah, it's it's interesting. I we we talk through our work, and the idea of getting us to actually talk is a in itself is a quite a great accomplishment, Sophie, for sure. But also, um, we 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 talk through our work, but at the same time, we learn about what we're doing through talking about our work. And I think that that's what um, that's when I when I look at the video that Sophie produced, um, I realized this is the first time that I put any of those ideas into words and somehow that helps to solidify intention and um you know and you get better at it as you as you the, you know as you as you lecture as you you know as people ask you what your new work's about blah 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 you you just get better at it but but that talking about it is it helps you form formulate your ideas and it's better for you to formulate your ideas than you know show the work read a read a a, a new york times review that trashes it and realize that <laughs> realize that Maybe I should have talked about it more, and maybe I, you know, maybe I should have given a little more direction as to what I was I was up to. Yeah. Um, right. I, I have I have talked to artists who have acknowledged that they they felt felt they were not good at talking about their art, and that it was not helpful to their careers in the long run, and then they wish that they could have learned to speak about their work earlier on. Um, but the other thing that that you know a lot I think that I that there are a lot of artists who feel, oh, well, the work speaks for itself. You know, I think that's been a long standing attitude that artists have, don't, don't ask me, just look at the art. But I think that time is really, it has come to an end because we're in a moment right now where 
people don't just want to see your artwork in a mu museum. They want to see your Instagram and they want to see you. They want to see the artist talking. And these things have become a lot more, the personality and the person, I should say, is more integrated into the work now more than ever. And um, when people get to make a, a human connection, that enriches the experience of the art. Absolutely. And, you know, it brings up this question of online presence, right? We all have our online presence and how big your footprint on the internet is or how, you know, sparsely you can be found, um, you know, is, is something that's always in balance. So, you know, I do start to wonder um, if this online presence, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Sophie's project, but, you know, into Instagram and so forth and so on, does it become an extension of your work? Do you find that it becomes an extension of your work because you're really you know, creating your own narrative or talking about your work or you're kind of in charge. John, you mentioned, you know, speaking for yourself as opposed to reading something in the New York Times. And I will add that, of course, if you read anything about your work in the Brooklyn Rail, it would be absolutely brilliant and illuminating. <laughs> That's the bar we set. Um, but, you know, but also the opportunity to tell your own story, you know, at certain moments uh, in your work is, is, very, is increasingly more important. How do you feel about that? Yeah, you know, the thing is, the problem with the social media and things like that is that the more information there's out there, what it creates is the opposite effect. You know, it basically negates things in a weird way. I think the artist profile is very specific in its in in its uh, information in that sense. It's not like a, it's not fluff in that sense. I think it's really important. The other thing is is uh, I know that Sophie's tried to get some interviews with Frank Stella and things like that. And that, that's the interesting thing about older artists when they get to the certain point where they've done this idea that you've done enough interviews and you don't want to say anymore. And I, I, I'm kind of looking forward to that time when I say, I have no more to say. <laughs> you know, say I shut the fuck up, but this, goodbye, see ya. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what Frank Stella told me that he said he had done, he had said everything he has to say. And then of course, you know, like three months later, I saw him do an, an interview, a, a video interview with Christie. Yeah, well, I have a Frank Stella story, but what it comes down to is I, I agree with Robert. Uh, I was in an elevator with him a couple of years ago and he knew I was going to say, hi, Frank, something. Right. And he put out a vibe that was so strong that he, he just said, don't it was as though don't even say a single word. And I thought. God, I would love to get to that point when somebody comes up to me where I put out that book. Don't even think about it. Fuck you. And I keep thinking yeah. that is success. That's success. <laughs> and if I could just get to that, fuck you, excuse me, I get a vibe. Good, good. Uh, then I will have it made. Um, but I too get to the point where at, right now there's so much where I want to just cave in. And I say, I have a few more things I need to do before I wrap it up. Please just let me do it and get on with it because I've got to dot a couple eyes here and, and not just, and sometimes for me, there are two things. One, when people see me because I look the way I look, it undercuts what I do. And that's been true all my life. Like, I can't believe, you know, and I keep thinking, well, Napoleon was a little guy. How come you trusted him? But so there's these stereotypes that people have about how you look and what you're able to do. And, and I also, I think sometimes all that media, you get to a point where you say, if I see one more narcissistic posting about who who had whatever, whatever birthday cake they ate with their friends. I'm, you know, you just go enough already. I really want maybe, you know, uh, less, less is more on some level. And I don't think it's what you're doing. So yeah, I think it's just the, you know, the Instagram, the this, the that, that it's the Twitter, the, uh, just so much and people don't edit. They just keep ego, ego, ego everywhere. And um, yeah. Yeah, but I think what I think what so what Sophie's doing in a way it's sort of this is this has been going on for a long time, right? Vasari did it with all his friends in the Renaissance. There's a kind of 
there's a kind of storytelling that you you basically you're you're allowing the artist to speak. You're documenting their 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 life and their work at a certain time, and I think that's gonna you know that is independent of social media and that's independent of that kind of obsession and that kind of I, I would call it an addiction actually not an obsession at this point um but um i think what sophie's doing is much more you know serious, serious. And timeless. yeah but there are there are a lot of clowns out there do, wanting to do interviews and i think uh, over the years i perfected a uh, technique to scare people away a little bit, you know, it's, it's, like the I, Frank Stella technique, you mean? Well, a little bit. It's just like it's, it's, you know, I, I just don't, I don't want to deal with bullshit. I don't want, you know, I don't want to deal with trendy shit. I, I just don't want to, you know, in that sense, I, I, I prefer to scare people. Maybe just if, if you have enough balls to ask me a question, then okay. But I just don't want to deal with that kind of trendy, useless stuff. It's, it is. You know, I want serious stuff. I'm very serious about it. I think we all are very serious about what we do and we want to be engaged on that level. I think it's really important for sure. Right, and Sophie, I think you're certainly cutting through the noise of the stream, the constant stream, you know, um, as Alice said of, you know, pictures of people's cappuccinos and you're creating something, you know, you're really coming at it as a filmmaker and creating something that will stand up and that will hold, that will, you know, that is kind of continuing, um, you know, the narrative of art history and that is is of quality. And you're also not just grabbing paparazzi style, you know, thoughts on artists' work. You're really, um, you know, asking for entrance and allowing them to speak. Um, it's interesting because John Kessler, I know a lot of your work has to do with surveillance and we are living in this age of surveillance, but we're also living in this age of constant, you know, um, if you're off your social media for, uh, I go for weeks without kind of going on Instagram and then I have like thousands of posts that I've missed and this idea of missing something. Um, uh, the idea of having a place where, um, you know, there's this quality and this attention to detail and to, uh, and to caring about what's being said and how it's being said and what's being shown is so different. Um, the question that I'm slowly getting to is, do you think that at this moment, all of you, um, after 18 months or now, it's almost two years of COVID and of social media and of Zoom conversations, how has that changed the way audiences are encountering art, um, you know, amid the noise of social media? And how is how has this project kind of helped you shape your message, for want of a better way of explaining it? What do you, where do you think we are right now in terms of the way people are expecting to see art and, and access art? I think they need it more now, now, now than ever. But I think they need serious, like I would say like what Sophie's doing. I mean, we, we mentioned the Times and I don't know, the Times has already de destroyed me on numerous occasions. So whatever I say, uh, <laughs> uh, we could have a chat about that. I say, you, until they've called you mindless, you haven't really <laughs> All right, just, I just want to put that out. But uh, as a young artist, mindless art. So just be prepared no matter what to have very thick skin. But, uh, but I think Sophie is going deep in a way in which a lot of things don't these days. It's just there, you know, and I'd say a lot of the time stuff now is not very deep. I think there's also, and I, as I've gotten much older, a kind of loneliness uh, as well, because there's all that stuff out there, but then the real conversations that you used to have with your friends, and maybe you guys have it, but as they disappear, I mean, my friends were people, you know, like Vito Acconci, he's not around to call up in the middle of the night and make and comfort me or, or others that, I, you know, and so there is also this peculiar loneliness that I experience even though there's so much stuff out there, but the really deep level of conversation I'm not that I used to have when I was younger, and also with people like Vito or Dennis or whoever, they're gone. And I have those conversations in my head, but I'm very conscious of the actors leaving the stage now mm -hmm. and how I, what I have to hold on to, you know, how I have to make sure I check in and um, and before I can't. And so that's a different thing than, you know, when you're young or when you're wanting all that publicity, because what you really want to be with with the, with with the with the people that are your tribe. 
and 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 they're not they're disappearing you're and uh um and you know it's just this kind of tristesse on we that is happening and um so right anyway right um question for Akminoro, who is a little bit of a younger artist compared to some of your uh, cohort today um do, do you feel that this has brought you a sense of community um, and it's kind of a question for all of you, but is this project different than other, um, you know, social media platforms or other ways that you're forming community as an artist? Yeah, I think so. I think earlier when you guys were talking about um, like attention span getting shorter and shorter, and then I was just thinking about how I agree, but I think that's because of what you guys were saying, how there's a lot of stuff that isn't really worth looking at, but I do think, um, when there is something that's a little bit longer and worth spending the time with, I feel like people do do it. And I, and that's kind of why I feel, you know, the project Sophie's doing is doing so well. And, um, and they're really great to watch, but in terms of community, yeah, I think so. Cause um, Sophie reached out and, you know, we've been in touch ever since it's happened, you know what I mean? And even like artists that she's interviewed, like we've met, through that, like, oh, you've been interviewed by Sophie, and I'm like, oh yeah, and then we kind of can have a connection there, and it kind of builds. So I do feel like it's a little different from other, like you said, other platforms, you know. Right, right. It's like a process that you share with someone, right? And this wonderful kind of intimacy, yeah. with Sophie and Matt, and then seeing your story told, you know, yeah. uh, so beautifully. It's, it's it's that bonding of of having shared that, which is so yeah. Great. And yeah. it seems like she really cares, and like she said, she's come to basically everything I've done since then, you know? Right. So it's really about the artists and the work. Right. And I think that shows. Right, right. One, right. one thing that, I, that I've always said is that my films are the greatest form of fan mail that I can come up with. <laughs> I'm a true fan of everybody in, in the archive. And thank you for saying that, Art, because I really do care. <laughs> I care very deeply about art. I care very deeply about getting the message of art to other people. So it's just helpful to hear everybody talk about that. I really appreciate it. Right, right. Did anyone have any surprises when they saw their final profile? Um, is it, you know, was it delightful? Was it, you know, did it take a while? Did you have to hear feedback from other people to know that it was okay? Did you immediately respond to it? What's it like to see yourself you know, in this, um, you know, elegant, uh, streamlined, crafted form. I'm always looking for the wrinkles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, there's the art and I'm really serious, but then I'm going, well, you know that, you know, what's that pimple or that freckle? So anyway, I keep, you know, I'm joking kind of, but um, it's just interesting to look to separate from yourself. You have an idea of who you are in your head and how you're performing. And you are performing, I think. We're all performing. And then it's watching the performance, you know, afterwards. And, you know, it's always, I mean, I think it's a funny thing. A lot of actors say they never look at themselves. And so there's always that you know, you're looking at yourself and you're critiquing yourself sometimes in, you know, it's vanity. It's not just about the art, but I would say I was, I really, really, uh, really enjoyed watching it wrinkles nonetheless. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, so, and, you know, I, I thought it was very succinct and, uh, you know, Sophie, thank you. And thank you for putting up with my stubbornness sometimes. I mean it, you know. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you. Alex. I did, I did have to be a little persistent and I'm glad that I did. <laughs> yours, yours is really one of the most, there's so much in it, you know, it's very comprehensive in, in, in a way. Yeah. And, um, and we, I just really appreciate you giving the access to, so that we could wow. do that. Yeah. Right, right. So Sophie, I'm wondering um, at this moment what the future holds, if you have thoughts or wishes about what you want the Artist Profile Archive to grow into, if um, I'm sure that you want to, you know, create more profiles of more artists, but do you think about doing follow-up pieces? Do you think about doing longer form pieces? Do you think about, um, you know, different ways of expanding the platform? 
Yeah, I do. I mean, I want to keep the essential format of the profiles going, but um, as and I want to, I want that to continue to happen. Maybe even if I'm not the one doing them, but for the films to end up on on the website because I am, I am going into longer format films now. And um, there's one film that we did which turned out really well on Shreen the Shot, and that film travels with her to the exhibitions. And we haven't put it on online because of that reason, because it, it you know, goes to, to these different shows. Um, so that's been, that's been very, you know, fulfilling to know that that film is, has actually been incorporated in some instances in, into the exhibition itself. And um, we did do a longer format film on Robert Longo that we just finished this summer that incorporated the, the Pace show and the Guild Hall show that he had over the summer. And I do, I do like the, the longer format films. Um, there's just something a little more gratifying about that whole process and about having to, you know, I, I've always tried to make the profile, when I, when I pitch the profile to an artist, I always try to tell them it's not gonna take that long. You know, it's only, we're not, we're not gonna be more than an hour and a half. I always try to make it sound like it's this manageable amount of time commitment. But what's really gratifying is when you have a lot of access and, and the artist is just willing to give, give the time that it takes. You know, that's, that's, um, that's when something really special can, can happen. And, um, you know, it's a different intention than the profiles because I like the profiles to be somewhat educational mm -hmm. and also immediately accessible and, and just, you know, some, a, a small time commitment. But the longer ones, um, you know, that, that's different. That's once you've established an, an interest. So we'll just continue doing, doing all of them. Great. So to everyone, uh, to our artists, in terms of documenting and in terms of creating archives, you know, um, I was about right before COVID, I was at the New York Public Library up at Lincoln Center going through somebody's archive and, you know, they were bringing me boxes and gloves and yelling at me because I kept putting the photograph down the wrong way. And, you know, I was there for two days just pouring over somebody's photographs. This is such a different medium, you know, this online possibility that Sophie has become be begun, do you see, um, and Sophie, this might not be your intention or maybe it is a new idea, but do you see this as a place where you could create uh, a long-term um, sort of archive of your work where things would start to get deposited and stored um, in a digital realm? Or is that something um, horrifying and scary? Just the idea of, of um, a life, work uh, being put someplace, um, you know, instead of the physical kind of, I was looking at photographs from the, you know, um, later half of the 20th century for someone at the New York Public Library, but, you know, is this a better or a different or an addition to kind of place for your archive? Well, we've already done that. Yeah, um, we've already done it. Done that. I, have, I mean, and, I have, uh, yeah. I have a closet full of, um, eight by 10 chromes that were shot, you know, by photographers when, you know, when I was showing at Learning Augustine, that's, that was the photography of the day. And then it went to two and a quarter or four by fives and all of that stuff's been scanned and digitized. And I think we're, that ship has left. But so. in terms of uh, something that uh, can be accessed by um, viewers, mm -hmm. by people, yeah. Eventually that would be the idea. I mean, I have, you know, I've carried these black and whites and these negatives and these slides all over the place, tried to store them, but it doesn't work. I mean, they can just turn to dust. And so that's what we have done. And so much of my work existed only as photographs anyway, it was all destroyed the first half. So, um, so really everything's digitized and, and then backed up and backed up and backed up to the point where we're kind of insane. Right. Um, but this notion of leaving something behind that other people can find, hopefully. So um, that's already started. And I, I per personally think it's, you know, it is because the other things are so fragile and any moment a house burns down or a studio gets, you know, water damaged or whatever and you you lose all that but if you you don't if it's on the cloud or it's backed up right. um so on the other hand i also 
I mean, I know personally that it's one thing to have all these things on the, on the computer screen and it all looks perfect, but there's nothing that is, you know, you can't compete with standing there and looking at the real thing. Absolutely. And, and I just don't see, I don't see one, yeah, go ahead, Robert, but I don't see one displacing the other and it's too bad if it does because the real thing always delivers. Well, that's what we that, that's what that's what we do. That's ultimately all these archives are one thing, but ultimately it's the work itself that's the most important thing. You know, yeah. and that, and I, I I just assume that these interviews are only to reinforce the fact that people should go see the work. That's the most important thing. I think that's why shooting exhibitions are really interesting. That you you get the sense that makes you want to go see the work. That's the other aspect to it. You, you want to really see it for real. You know, okay. in that sense, I think that's important. You so, hope. I mean, well, there is so much that is constantly in flux, particularly today. And so I guess that notion of having something exist forever and ever is, has always been an, a romantic delusion. <laughs> but, uh, but on the other hand, I mean, that ultimately is still in our heart of hearts, what we want, I think. But I also think just, um, it is important seeing this stuff, but like sometimes, like for example, like someone in high school that lives, <laughs> you know, somewhere else like me when I was in DC, I couldn't really go to these places. And so I would go on YouTube, look up just to listen to what are the artists were saying, how they talk about their work or like what their paintings sort of look like outside of like a JPEG, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, yeah, it's great to see the real thing, but you know, I think it's wonderful to have another option when you don't have that as a possibility. And I think um, that's why I think it's a great project. Both and, I'd say both and. There's some people who want to get rid of the first, but I, you know, both and is to me. But on the other hand, you travel all over the world, you may only get to see an observatory in downtown Delhi once in your life, but you get to see the photographic documentation of it and dream yourself into it and fantasize about it, make your whole life's work about it. And then you get your two days on the site and, you know, it's, it's a juxtaposition of so many different things. And really that's been true since photography was invented, I think. Right. So. right. And I think there's been a debate since photography was invented about photography replacing the actuality of the, you know, being in the yeah. physical right. presence of work uh, or of yeah. a person or of anything else for that matter. Yeah. But the idea of um, a public archive, I think, Ark, you bring up a really good point that we sometimes forget here in Brooklyn that there might be someone, you know, in a much more remote place or in a situation where they don't have access to hopping on a subway to see something in person. And that this, this does, in addition to so much of what we've talked about today, it does provide access to something that um, hopefully gets people to see work in person. But for those who, for whatever reason, aren't able to do that, it offers them a window or a rabbit hole into worlds that they don't have access to. So there is this great, equity in that. And that's why I like to say that, you know, the Artist Profile Archive is trying to do its share in, in democratizing contemporary art, because not only is it about creating these uh, um, digestible, this digestible information to, for, uh, so that you can have an education, but at the same time, you know, ideally, <coughs> you'll see the exhibitions in the film and then want to go see them in person. But, but the other thing is that I always you know, like to think about the people who don't have access to art. And this is a way of bringing art, the art to them. And they can still have the experience of it even though they're nowhere near it. So it's, it's in, that, in that way, it's also giving people access who, who wouldn't normally have it. Right. Right. And something I think that we're also aware of, you know, there were a couple of months um, in March when we first shut down where even doing pieces for the real, we were all scrambling for online, you know, galleries that had online, you know, rooms that you could go into because everything was shut down. There was this moment that none of us ever anticipated happening, right, where right. you couldn't go to places. So to have something like this, this is such a wonderful resource and, and does make, you know, those of us who are lucky to be able to 
come and go within, say, the New York art world um, or travel, it does make you realize that not everyone has the privilege and to democratize it, I think, is, is such a wonderful goal and to make something available in public on such, you know, on the internet, you know, where, which so many people do have access to right now and to have something there that's available to them is so commendable, so be. Um, so Malika, uh, unless anybody else, if anyone else has something they're dying to say about this that I haven't touched on in my questions, or if there's anything that you want to say to each other, if uh, I encourage you to do that, or we could also open it up to some of our questions uh, from our from our guests. I'll jump in here. Um, thank you all so much. We've had uh, a handful of questions pour in, but this has been an incredible conversation. Uh, just up until this point, and I'm so excited to see the second half of it. Um, really quickly, Sophie, love so much the idea that, you know, the archive is also a way of traversing the world and opening it up to everyone. And Ark, what you said really resonates with us. Um, it really feels like what everyone is talking about is a delight in the living archive of culture. Um, and that's, you know, so, so vital. Uh, so our first question will come from the lovely Lynn Crawford. Lynn, take it away. Thank you. Um, this has been wonderful. And it's funny because I, I was thinking, I mean, I'm a writer, so I'm logocentric, but I always feel like it's visceral. Once, once I talk about art and once I talk about it with someone or anything, the body comes into it. And there have been a lot of times with artists where the conversation starts off and they're kind of frozen. And so it's a real testament to you, Sophie, I think that you got people to talk. But I find just friends or whatever, over time they warm up to it and they get excited and they enjoy it. And it's something that I think some of my friends who are artists feel like they can't talk. They don't have the skills to talk, which is why they express themselves visually. And they're, they're just not talkers, but they can be under the right conditions, which I guess maybe describes, Sophie, what you've managed to achieve here. I mean, I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but did you find that sometimes some people were sort of frozen because they felt like I can't really talk, but I can express I myself otherwise? Well, I, I guess. I mean, there are some there are some artists who are not big talkers and don't want to answer certain questions. And and, you know, we just have to work with that. But I, I know what you're saying as far as some people just feel like that's their communication and and but they can talk in the right circumstances when they, oh, when they want yeah when they or when it's right. the right situation i think there's a protective instinct sometimes too where they don't want to say too much or say it the wrong way so i think this is a real testament to maybe your skills at knowing how to approach sensitivity to that well, th thank you. Um, I have had some artists say, you know, oh, I never said that before, or I haven't, you know, mentioned that or, or what have you. And, and um, that is, that is just a really um, great thing to hear. But I think that it is because of my, my curiosity and because of, I think of myself as a student that um, it, it is easy. It's just easy to ask questions and, and to have a flow and to have it be conversational, even though it doesn't look like it's a conversation, mm -hmm. there is there is still a flow that takes place during the interview. And um, yeah, and I like to think, I do like to think that I'm easy to talk to. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Well, you certainly are easy to talk to. Um, I think uh, let's, I'm going to do something. Let's get one thing straight, though, is I make art because words are not enough. So that's yeah. Uh, I want to make that really clear. You know, I words are not enough. That I make that's why I make art. That's basically it. Well, and that's why these aren't essays. That's why the profiles aren't essays. <laughs> but I but I was gonna say to answer uh Lynn's question, I do think uh Sophie is good at it because I am one of those people who um I don't think I'm particularly good at talking, not just like about art, but just in general. I feel like I have to say something like, oh, I probably didn't say that right. So I do feel as if when I was talking to Sophie, the way she sort of guided the conversation um, helped. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. You were really good. I don't know why you think that. 
<laughs> yeah, that, that, was, that was a fun conversation. That was a, what we call a walk-in talk because we were walking through the exhibition and talking about the work that was on the wall. And it was, that was a really fun talk. Yeah, yeah, I had a good time. Yeah, I did too. Well, thank you all so much for jumping in, of course, um, speaking so highly of Sophie's ability to talk um, and set people at ease. Uh, I'm going to ask the next question. And I think it jumps off of Lynn's question a little bit, but it's also open to everyone. Uh, so clearly everyone, Sophie, is talking about your persistence, your ability to make artists feel calm, and also how you can negotiate that space between you know, people wanting to be known, but wanting to preserve space. Um, and also, you know, opening opening up space for people to talk and use that talking as a methodology for exploring uh, more about their work. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your particular techniques and philosophy of the artist interview. Um, and this is also a question for Anne as an editor of documentaries. Like you're, you know, doing interviews. What makes a good interview? What makes a good conversation? Um, and can you share a couple of your your tricks or tools? Um, well, you know, the research is, is one tool. I mean, being knowledgeable, um, about, about the artist having had actual experiences of seeing the artist's work and, and, and being a fan, I think all of that really helps. And, um, and, you know, the one, the one thing that, that I, I do like to talk about with artists is, you know, and this invariably comes up at the end. I mean, the artists are, you know, I always feel like the people I, I speak with, they, they could have done other things, but they're artists. And, and that makes me, that leads me to believe that they have some firm conviction in what the potential of art really is. I mean, why dedicate yourself, why dedicate your life to something unless you have a very firm conviction about, about what it can do? And I always like, like to bring that up. And I think that that's something that maybe people don't think about a lot of times. Especially, you know, when you look at it in, in terms of your career and the years that you've spent doing something. Um, and I, I always find the answer to that question is very illuminating and, and often um, emotional as well. So that, that, that's, that's kind of my, um, if I were to say that the, in, the interview is leading up to, to one thing, in a sense, it, it's that, you know. What, what is it about art that is bringing us all here? How are we going to articulate that? And, and everybody gives a different answer. That's incredible. Um, I'd love to pass it to Anne next. Oh, I would say I, in my other life, I'm a documentary film editor. Um, and I heard years ago from a dear friend of mine, the filmmaker Nigel Noble, that what he tries to do when he's speaking with someone is there are questions that everyone knows that they're going to get, right? Where did you go to school? Why do you work in clay? But that he really likes to ask a question. And I think Sophie does this too from watching her documentaries that maybe surprises someone. You know, we have this idea maybe uh, that's mistaken that someone has this brilliant, perfectly articulated idea uh, in their head and then they go in and make the work and the work, you know, in the end perfectly mirrors that. But I think sometimes um, work is made and then conversation follows that is surprising, you know, just as surprising to the artist as it is to uh, the person in conversation with them. And I think that those are the moments, you know, um, I find as an editor that I'm always looking for the moments in cinema that have that spark, that have that, that realness and that unexpectedness where the camera melts away and the lights or whatever melt away. Um, and someone's really having a moment uh, which only really happens in conversation, specific to conversation, where things are being said and, you know, there's a certain flow and it's wonderfully dynamic and exciting and it's something that you would not get in another medium, which is not to say that an essay or a book or a you know, review, because uh, we love reviews, um, or an artist statement wouldn't have those things, but there's an intimacy, there's a wonderful intimacy that a good documentary brings to a process and to, um, you know, to the life of, of any subject matter, but an artist in particular that gives you that, as a viewer, that wonderful moment. I think that's what you're always looking for. And then shaping those things into something coherent and resonant, I think is, is the trick to that, but enough of that. Uh. 
And that's such a comprehensive answer. I love that. Um, and I'd, I'd love to, before we move to our next question, sort of pass it around the room. Everyone here has been sort of interviewed plentifully, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on what makes for a particularly good artist interview on the, from the position of the artist, from the position oh, of the interviewee. Yeah. I like what Anne just said. And I would also say that part of the reason why I make art, it's like a sentence. This is what I tell my students. You start out with a word, it becomes a sentence, it becomes a paragraph, and you have hunches. You're playing off what you did before, but you're putting something forward that's that you're not quite sure of, and you want to see if it works. You're seeing, um, and and then if in an interview the same thing happens that you know all of a sudden you just like you're you discover something that you didn't know about yourself when you do the work. And if you keep telling yourself something that you already know, then maybe the work is getting a little stale. So there's always that risk. And in the conversation, um, uh, you also might find that moment where you're not just saying everything you've said before, but you all of a sudden a little bit of light goes off. But I like to use the phrase, and I have to get this in, Tom Waits in one of his songs, for me, it's, I call it waltzing Matilda, but it's sort of like that moment where he's walking around late at night, sort of out of it. And he's asking for just a few more bucks to go waltzing Matilda. And that's what I think for me being an artist is about. Battered old suitcase to a hotel someplace in a wound that will never heal. And you keep going down and saying one more, give me one more shot at this to get it. And of course you never do quite get it because you got to do it again and call it what you want an addiction or this or that. But um, it's that moment where you're taking just a risk and you're not sure if it's going to work or not, but you've got to try it because maybe this time you've nailed it. And in an interview, if it really gets to that point with somebody has that, oh yeah, then I think it's really a good interview. So um, I love that, Alice. And it, it really um, it's it's experience that generates um, that philosophy that I, and I just adore what you just said. Um, the other thing about it, I've done a lot of interviews where, <clears throat> you know, someone comes in with a, a list of questions and some of them might be stock questions. Some of them might be um, from research, but there's not really a conversation going on. And I think that that's one of Sophie's um, strengths is that it's a conversation. It's, it's, it's improv, it's, you know, you, you, and <clears throat> uh, there's a question that gets asked, you answer it, um, but then there's a follow-up based on what you just said. And that's where, that's where the magic happens. It's not in, you know, a formulaic, um, you know, one, two punch, it's, it's the exchange. I know this song really well, the waste, uh, wasted and wounded. I feel like that all, all the time, but yeah, <laughs> but it's not what the moon did. Yeah. <laughs> but the, th the thing is, is I think with interviews, the, the most critical thing for me has been that the people who are, are, are interviewing you know your work really well. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've actually asked people to leave when I realized they don't know what I've been doing. They, just, they only know a certain aspect of it, you know, especially if you've been making art for a while, you would expect them to do some research for, before they, so I just say, you don't know it, get out of it, go away, I, I don't want to waste my time. <laughs> I think, I think that's the most important thing that they're, that they're, they're prepared, that they know your work, that's, that's really critical for sure. Well, one thing that I wanted to add is that, you know, even though we're talking about all these great interviews and, and the, that the profiles turn out so succinctly, you know, there's a part in the middle there where Matt and I are editing and I just look at him and I say, how are we going to make anything out of this? And, you know, in the beginning, we would just plod through, but now Matt just looks at me and he says, you know, we've been here before. <laughs> we're gonna get, we're gonna make it happen and it's just you always feel like you have to say that <laughs> but there is a moment where it just does seem like this is not going to come together the way that i thought it would but then it it, it does it does process trust trust the process right 
Yeah, but I had to throw that in there lest anybody think that it's just like a, you know, yeah, just yeah. a few sentences and then we'll be left with all of the, you know, the board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm always amazed at how easy people think documentary filmmaking is. And I'm also always amazed at how um, they think it should be quick. You know what I mean? Like, they're like, oh, that 90 minute film, what did that take you a week or so? Like, you know, and I'm like, oh, 13 months, in fact, you know, um, but just that trusting the process, which is so hard, Sophie, in those moments when you're kind of lost and there's this, um, you know, abundance of material that needs to be, you know, culled and shaped. Um, just hanging in there with process like anything else. Thank you, Sophie. And thank you everyone for those remarks. Sophie, I think it's a wonderful reminder that artist interviews like is your art practice. Um, and I love Alice, what you said about kind of play and risk being essential elements. It reminds uh, us earlier this week, we had James Lawrence on our program to speak about Richard Serra with uh, our very own Fong Bui. And he said this really vital line, he said, play is experiments in risk. Um, and so, so vital to the work, which uh, I think is kind of floating in the room right now as well. Uh, I know we're kind of chugging along for time. Uh, our next question is going to come from the lovely G.E. Schwartz. And then I think we'll pass it to our wonderful publisher, Fang Bui. But G.E., take it away. Thank you so much. I, I see this is so much in line, the archive work that you're doing with what the rail has been doing for all these years is one of the reasons I keep coming back to wanting to be a part of, you know, hanging in there and listening and learning. And the question is, and I think this may be a bigger question here or a question that maybe thinks about bigger things. Do you hope or do you strive uh, for your project for the archive to even transcend art and artists to approach kind of a way of bringing folks together within the community of uh, our larger human experience? Well, you mean like different categories of, of collections, like different? Well, know, I, I, I think what you're doing is, for, for instance, we, needed, we need to build our civilization up and hold everything that we have so strong. And I think that what you're doing is you're certainly building a big block of this into that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, bigger than just the artist and, and the art, it, you know, this is like a big cornerstone of, of adding as the Brooklyn Rail does to, to building up what we have and need to hold dear. So, you know. Yes, and there, yeah, it's like, um, definitely it's, it's a holding place for, for all of this, all of this information. And, and hopefully people will think of it as a resource that they can come to and get consistent quality information and you know it's not necessarily going and culling through all of the YouTube videos which we know what that can be like sometimes like why does this have six million hits but um but you know it's, it's going somewhere where you know the quality is going to be there and the information is going to be there thank you GE I think I think um we follow each other on Instagram <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Instagram, <laughs> so sweet. elephant in the room. Right. <laughs> oh God, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for your um, for your thoughts. Uh, I think uh, right before we pass it to our very own publisher and artistic director Fang Bui, uh, we had a comment in the chat or request to know that after viewing all of the uh, profiles. Uh, of one another and being in conversation together, do any of the artists have questions that have emerged for uh, for one another? Is there anything? No, I, like I think we should just all have dinner before at some point in the next five years before you know everybody leaves the. Uh, it'd be nice to kind of connect up, but uh, other than that, you know, I'd love to talk to everybody. Uh, person to person instead of zoom 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 but other than that no but it's really nice to see everybody and meet uh meet and our, art. yeah right. ours profile dinner that sounds kind of i that sounds like a great idea actually but don't could we just say what we feel and not have it on tape definitely because <laughs> there are a lot of things that i say that i really don't want memorialized if you know what i mean or tony the little man who lives in my mouth says things that you know he just gets out of control and then i have to pull him back 
So if we had the dinner, it definitely would, let's not secretly tape it if possible. No cameras. We will have yeah, a yeah. no cameras and, dinner. Tony really does, you know. <laughs> red rum, red rum. Exactly, right. exactly. I tell my students all the time, forgive me, I, I can't account for what Tony might say. <laughs> Alice, where, where are you teaching now? Oh, SVA for the, uh, it's forever. And right. I know you've been at Columbia forever, and I've been at SVA forever, ever, ever. I guess right. they're going to take me out in a body bag, maybe. I don't know. But it's got to be. A, they don't enforce retirement, so you keep right. crawling back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is no, thing, no such thing as retirement in our profession. No, but teaching there might be. Yeah. Yes, the teaching rest of might. it, no, no, absolutely not. But the <clears> teaching <throat> thing, you know, eventually, but. Otherwise, yeah, there is no such thing, which is why they have to keep, you know, that's why we have to stay on Instagram, I guess. So they know <laughs> <laughs> because everyone wants to see your coffee, you know, the flower. <laughs> yes, and know, you know, what your child is doing and all those things. And everyone's children are so perfect. And I don't know. I mean, I, I'm on Instagram so that I can just yell at things more than <laughs> anything else. But anyway, <laughs> I will definitely be following you immediately. <laughs> <laughs> we don't post that much. <laughs> okay. And I definitely don't post about my uh, offspring. That would be no, I'm, I'm not allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to, I, I almost, I don't want to continue um, and move us along. I just want to hold the Zoom in this, in this beautiful, precious space of our dinner party to come. Uh -huh. um, but Zoom waits for no man. Um, and uh, I have the pleasure of passing the mic next to our very own Fong H. Bui. Uh, Fong, the floor is yours. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Robert, mm -hmm. Alice, and for the conversation moderating with John, Ark. It's, uh, I don't know how to begin, but I grew up uh, in Hue, the, the imperial uh, capital of Vietnam, where you guys remember the Tate Offensive. So I grew up having Alexander Lilleberman book, Artists in His Studio, the original that was published by Viking Press in 1960. So the book's already in my home before I was born. Uh, so I grew with that book and was so astonishingly um, compelled by the artist studio. You remember the Picasso, Leger, um, Matisse and others, mostly Parisian school, which is exactly how Liberman became the artistic director of Condé Nash. That was the whole idea uh, is to go to Paris and brought to bring the culture of Paris to New York after the war. Um, and it was, it stayed with me forever. And fast in, you know, fast forward in 1993 when Toni Morrison won the Nobel Prize. Uh, and I remember from that speech where she say, um, the phrase that we come the first phrase that we all remember, you remember that beautiful thing she say where uh, the first sentence of our childhood that we all remember, the phrase one upon the time. <laughs> and I think that is, a, is what uh, is frustrating so much about the left, what we learn. You know, they, they so invested in facts. They don't understand the narrative at all. So when it, you know, came and talk about um, pressing, you know, the, the great Conway about where's your facts? She came up the, well, alternative facts, remember? I mean, it's just so sad that we forget about the history of a person, the narrative of a person. It's huge. It's big deal. Just exactly what Ron, John, Ron just referred to, uh, you, the great, the life of the artist by Vasari, 16th century. He wrote that when he was 30, you know, that, that eventually create the whole um, art history. 
tradition that we rest upon. But I, I just wanted to add this, Sophie. It's terrific because uh, when Tom has the legendary art editor, chief editor of Art News, I think he came on board in 49 and 72. That's when he passed the baton to Bessie Baker. But during his, his editors, editorship, he uh, would ask art historian or writer or critic to spend time with the artists in their studio. And one of them being, of course, Urban Sandler. And I love and admire Urban because he wrote for the rail beginning. Um, and he invented this term, it's called on the spot art history. You don't know anything about the artists until you spend time with him or her or them in their studio talking. And that's exactly what you provided. It's an indispensable archive. And I must say, echoing what Robert just said too, because I had the pleasure of interview Alex, I didn't quite do it with Robert or John or Ark, uh, but the fact is that doesn't matter how smart you are at the real perspective, even we have several our writers or PhD or historian or not, they still have to do the homework. We create an, an, a dossier and we ask all of them to read it over and come up with new question. Not never repeat the question. I get super annoyed when those who do not prepare and do their homework. And so that's what we are trying to do. And that gives a greater comfort, but still, what you have there is a rare gift, Sophie. And we commend you. So therefore, we want to celebrate a big dinner. I will host it at my home. Oh, <laughs> and no camera, Alex, no camera. <laughs> that would be so great, Bong. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be such a celebration. Yes. We earned, this. we earned this, Sophie, everyone. And of course, you will be the few among the artists. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that would be great. Uh, huge admiration, keep going, and the rail will find a way to help, collaborate any way we can. And uh, so that's, that's it for me. I give it back because I'm dying to hear Angela read. So uh, thank you all, and uh, you, back Bong. to you, Bobica. Thank you, Fong. Thank you, Fong. Um, so as Fong mentioned, at The Rail, we have a storied tradition of ending our community events, always with a poetry reading. And today I'm so thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of this afternoon, Angela Narciso Torres, to the stage. Poet Angela Narciso Torres is the author of What Happens Is Neither, which came out with four-way books just this year. She's the author of To the Bone, which came out last year, and Blood Orange, which came out with Willow Books 2013. Recent work has appeared in Poetry Mag, Poetry Northwest, and Prairie Spooner. She also received the first prize in the Yates uh, Poetry Prize. Um, she currently serves as senior and reviews editor for Rhino Poetry. Born in Brooklyn and raised in Manila, uh, please give it up for Angela Narciso Torres, uh, who I believe is tuning in from San Diego. Yes, hi everyone. Thank you, Malvika. Hi. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this incredible conversation. Thank you, Alice, John, Ark, Robert, and Anne for, for this amazing dialogue. I learned so much and I'm, I'm so inspired hearing all your stories. And Sophie for, in, for building this, this community, this vibrant community through the Artist Profile Archive, which I hadn't heard about before this because you know I come to the Brooklyn Rail mostly for poetry events and it's always nice to experience that cross-pollination and see the parallels in our creative process. Um, I got so much from your conversation, but what I kept hearing was this, there was this, um, this kind of a tension between the need for space as artists, privacy, but also a hunger for real conversation, real connection, a need to be seen. And that um, speaks so um, loudly and clearly to me as a writer, where you're mostly writing in isolation and you, you just, um, you know, you're constantly being called upon by the world to participate in events, write blurbs, uh, read your poetry. And so your public persona is always being called upon and uh, to move away from the desk. And it's really only the artist himself who can say or herself who can say 
today I really have to just make time for myself and make time for my art. Um, so I, I'm just grateful for um, hearing about this incredible bridge of um, between our, our private and public worlds that that um, Sophie has has so incredibly uh, made um, possible in this community. Madeline Lengel once said that our truest responsibility to the irrationality of the world is to paint or sing or write, for only in such response do we find truth. Um, I wrote my book, my most recent book, as an homage and elegy to my parents whom I lost two years ago, my mother to Alzheimer's and my father uh, 11 days later to cancer and a broken heart. Writing the book was my way of processing my grief and to grapple with the question of how do we reconstruct our, ourselves, ourself after devastating loss? Um, I think it was Robert who said, I make art because words are not enough. And I would say to that, I write poetry because language is not enough. Um, regular language, you know, prose or um, newscasting or, or even writing in your journal. Poetry cuts through that endless noise that we were talking about earlier, the stream of social media, of just, um, it just cuts to the bone. And as Alice said, we write to what we don't know. We write to discover what else is there that we, we didn't know. Um, it's like that wound that will never heal. Grief is that wound and language is inadequate, but we do it, we take risks uh, as we do in art. I'll just read two poems, one from the book and some new work. I'll just read the title poem. And the title of my book is What Happens is Neither. And it's also the title of the poem I'm about to read. And it's the first line. What happens is neither the end nor the beginning. Yet we're wired to look for signs. Consider the peonies. One makes a perfect bud after months of nothing. Another's leaves are ringed with black rot. How can I not think end? How can I not say beginning? Leaves fall when days shorten because a tree must reduce to its tough parts twig, branch, bark. My mother sleeps away the daylight. She nods off while chewing a spoonful of fish and rice. Her head a peony gone to, see, to seed. Father calls to say she doesn't recognize him. Turning to him, she cried out. Certain a stranger was in her bed. He played his violin till she slept, a leaf in late fall curling into itself. In autumn, chlorophyll disappears, canceling green from leaves so yellow and magenta can blaze. In my mirror, I see her, the smile that favors a cheek, eyes slanting in the shape of small fish we eat for breakfast. Trees know best the now of things. What goes on has been going on for centuries. Washing dishes, I rest a foot on my standing leg. A fork clangs on the tile. I rinse a cracked cup. I try not to think of endings. So um, on October 20, I, was test I tested positive for a breakthrough case of COVID-19, uh, despite vaccinations, masks, all of that. And while it's been a really slow recovery, I was grateful that I could recover from home. Um, and part of my healing was this practice, a friend and I started of exchanging poems for each day of my isolation. We wrote in the Japanese form of tanka, which is five lines, a short form, I'm thinking of Sophie's short form of videos, short form, manageable, doable, in, um, and, and very portable. Uh, it follows the syllabic count of 57577. We live an hour north of San Diego and our backyard faces a canyon. And I never examined that view from my window as closely I did writing these poems in isolation, the canyon, the hawk, the fog, the hills beyond. Uh, nature as art is a healer and ob observing nature I found a can really reward us with understanding some of the most inexpressible experiences in life. Um, I'd like to, inspired by all of you and your courage to share your vulnerability through these short videos, uh, which I'm dying to watch each and every one of them. I'd like to share some of this experiment with you. Uh, it's new work. It's one of you said, that, you know, when, when Sophie came in your studio, it's like, this is brand new work. It's, I, I feel I need to protect it. But I feel that also with all of you in sharing your work, in the end, there was gratitude because we need these connections. We need to all feel those undercurrents that make us all human. 
Um, I, I, I continued this experiment and completed 30 days of writing. That was two days ago that it finished. And um, I'll, I'll just, ex I excerpted 10 short parts to share with you. A little rabbit hole into my world, if you will. The self-isolation pages. Day one, only the moon came over the hills, a good nurse in sensible shoes. <clears throat> my breath caught in the branches of my ribs. Day three, one day I could finish my sentences. The next, today the gray dove struts on the fence, unfolds a note to the wind. Day six, you miss the daily things you can't do, held by doors or days, little things, pruning roses, salting a stew, how the mailbox creaked open. Day seven, a bed of roses. The sea, a truck, ashes, soil, lettuce, nails, the wrong side of, make ones, raise the, get into. Day nine, on the ninth day, rain. The hawk on the tower tucks beak to chest, almond speck in the storm's milky froth a seed scheming its rebirth. Day 11, what the silence said. Look, the crepe myrtle turned gold while you slept. And look, a new clan of wrens chitters behind the broken fountain. Day 19, a bird cries into the sycamore. The mist unrolls a blank sheet on my list of failures. Start over under where you are. Day 20, milk blue fog insists, is undramatic and calm like a living room I once knew. One learns to move with smoke, shadow, this white weight. Day 22, who would know better than a spoon the taste of tears? I choose a blue scarf to placate the rain, sweet tang of grapefruit in my mouth. Day 24, I'm learning to breathe again. The hawk doesn't ask whether the wind blows before plunging from its height. I renew my vows to air. And the last one, day 30. Through a clear window, sun like honey, lacquering the canyon's wide cup. I try the lock, step into light. The door was never shut. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, everyone give it up for Angela Narciso Torres. Uh, what happens is neither is out now. It came out this year with Four Way Books. Get your copy at the link in the chat. Um, thank you, thank you so much for that reading. And thank you, Ark, thank you. Alice, Robert, John, uh, and for all your wonderful questions. So rigorous and thoughtful. Thank you, Sophie, especially for bringing us all together. Uh, so beautifully. As always, we'll share the recording of today's reading on our event archives. It'll be available in a day or two if ever you wish to revisit this magical space. And we do this every day here at The Rail. So please join us again tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern when we celebrate the 17th anniversary of the review panel presented by Art Critical with Sharmista Ray, Barry Schwabsky, Mar Marjorie Wey Waylish, David Brody, Lily Way, Alexi Wirth, Karen E. Jones, Christopher Stackhouse, and Robert Storr in conversation with editor and publisher David Cohen and with an extra special introduction from Fong H. Bowie. Uh, they'll be in conversation on four current exhibitions up right now in New York City and we'll close with a poetry reading by Glynis Eldridge. That'll be at 1 p.m. Eastern right here in the Zoom. Other than that, thank you all so much. I'll invite you to turn on your microphone so you can say hello to one another, uh, goodbye bye on your way out or anything else that compels you. Um, but this was so, so special. Thank you for sharing the space. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you Thank so much, everyone. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, Thanks so Sophie. Nice Thank you, Robert. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Alice. Thanks, Alice. Thank you, Angela. Are. Thank you, John. Bye. Thanks, John. Good to see you again. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Angela. Really, really, really great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so Angela. A beautiful reading. Beautiful reading. Bravo. Beautiful Bravo. conversation. Yes. Alice, I'll be your friend.
Okay, well, I'll be on the lookout. All right. Thank you. Don't have a pseudonym because I won't know. That. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Get, get home safe. And uh, bon appetit. Courage. Yes. Have a great dinner. Bye. 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 Take care, everyone.